2002 is a year that will forever live in infamy for James Bond fans. What should have been a triumph, the 40th anniversary of the James Bond franchise ended in disaster with the release of Die Another Day, which would turn out to be Pierce Brosnan's swan song as James Bond. Now, to give the film its due, this movie was not a box office flop. In fact, it was the most popular James Bond movie of all time up to the moment. But fans did not like this movie one bit, and neither did the general public. People mocked it for its over-reliance on CGI, its unfocused performance by Pierce Brosnan, the Madonna theme song, and much, much more. Clearly, something needed to be done about the franchise, but what? To their eternal credit, Eon Productions, headed by Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli, knew that something had to change. They saw Die Another Day, and with their critical eye, they knew just as well as James Bond fans that it was not a good movie and that some big changes needed to be made. Now, here's where things get a little bit controversial. Pierce Brosnan ultimately would be replaced as James Bond. But when they were starting the 21st James Bond film, the idea was always that Pierce Brosnan was in fact going to return. Something interesting happened in the early 2000s. Eon Productions was able to reacquire the rights to both Never Sin Ever Again and the 1967 version of Casino Royale. Most importantly, it was also able to acquire the rights to film the Casino Royale novel, and they decided to use this as a base for the next James Bond movie. And it would be the first time that an Ian Fleming novel would actually be adapted in years. In fact, I think one has to go back all the way to Moonraker, if you could even call that an adaptation, because it really has almost nothing in common with the book that it's based on. Casino Royale would actually hem pretty closely to the plot, and the idea was always to make Vesper Lind, who was the Bond girl in that novel, the girl that James Bond finally falls in love with. Neil Purvis and Robert Wade got to work on the screenplay, and indeed grounded the film in an emotional connection between Lind and Bond. But here was the thing. At the time, Pierce Brosnan was already in his 50s, and for some reason they just didn't think that Pierce Brosnan would really be able to sell the love story aspect of the film. It didn't really make sense that James Bond, as hard-bitten as he is, and a veteran at this point would so easily succumb to the charms of Vesper Lind and be totally won over by her. It probably could have worked if you cast a really strong and maybe older actress in the role, somebody that was closer to Pierce Brosnan's age, but as a typical James Bond movie, especially in the Pierce Brosnan mode, it was never going to work. So Pierce Brosnan was off filming after the sunset with Brat Ratner. There were negotiations and negotiations, and then one day he apparently got a phone call from Robert Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson saying that it was over, that they were moving on, and that he was a great James Bond, and Pierce Brosnan in the years since has not seemed to be particularly understanding of the desire to move on. In fact, I think Pierce Brosnan is a little bit bitter at the way that he was dismissed from the part, and one could get his point to some degree. Because the thing is, Die Another Day, and in fact all of his James Bond films, were tremendously popular at the box office. Each successive installment was more popular than the last, so you could see why Pierce Brosnan probably thought he had a good thing going, and he deserved the a material that would eventually go to his replacement. Placement. So, who was going to replace James Bond? Everybody was guessing at this point who was going to be the man to take over the 007 mantle, and so many names were thrown around. For a while, it looked like Julian McMahon, who was big off of Nip Tuck, could possibly get the role. In fact, a lot of people thought that he was a frontrunner, although it turned out to not be the case. In fact, the one that was the closest to getting the role of James Bond was actually Henry Cavill, who was one of two finalists. The other finalist was a blonde actor named Daniel Craig. Now, the reason a young Henry Cavill didn't get the part is because he was only in his early 20s at the time and they just felt that he was too young to play the role, even if in the Casino Royale screenplay, James Bond isn't a full-fledged 007 agent yet and is actually just starting. The decision eventually was made to go with Daniel Craig, who was seen as a really off-kilter choice. For one thing, Daniel Craig, while very attractive, is not necessarily conventionally handsome in the Pierce Brosnan way. Another thing is the fact that he had blonde hair. This was such a huge sticking point for Sim James Bond fans. It's hard to even imagine now, but this was so controversial back then. Everybody was calling him James Blonde, and they were signing petitions online. Oh yes, everybody loves online petitions to replace him. And I remember the media just attacking him over and over again. Nobody thought that he was going to be good as James Bond, but boy, oh boy, did he show them. Yes. Considerably. 
Apparently the story is that Barbara Broccoli, from the time she saw Layer Cake and throughout all of his successive screen tests, knew that Daniel Craig was going to absolutely ace the role as James Bond. Even if other people didn't quite think that he was right for the part, Barbara Broccoli knew that Daniel Craig was the man. and. Her choice turned out to pay off massively because Daniel Craig transformed the role. The most obvious person to us was Daniel Craig. In fact, I don't even know if the series would still be going if you didn't have somebody like Daniel Craig playing the lead. For a grittier actor, they needed to have a grittier James Bond film. Enter the screenplay, which is by Robert Wade and Neil Purvis, with an assist by Paul Haggis, who was just coming off of winning an Oscar for Crash. This would be an origin tale in which a young James Bond is newly given his 00 designation after two assassinations. He's sent to play a high stakes poker tournament against the villainous Le Chiffre, who's the money man for an international terrorist network. James Bond's job is to clean him out so that Le Chiffre will be assassinated by his handlers. Now, people have often compared Casino Royale to Batman Begins, and indeed, you could almost call this film James Bond Begins. It rebooted the series in an exciting and fresh way, essentially reinventing the character for a whole new generation of filmgoers, but at the same time not ignoring the formula that made the franchise so successful. So let's get to the script, co-written by Paul Haggis. And it's very faithful to the In Fleming novel. In fact, I think most of the things that people really like about this movie come directly from the novel. One is the strong relationship between James Bond in West Berlin, including that horrific final line when he says, The bitch is dead which is remarkably cold-blooded, but really does work for the character. Also, another scene that surprisingly made it intact into the film is the famous testicular torture scene with a carpet beater. Every single guy that went to see this movie was cringing and yowling throughout. Ah! Of course, the script is indeed peppered with a few really strong action sequences that do not exist in the book, but hey, you know what? It's still a James Bond movie and they had to deliver. I give the script for this one a really strong 9 on 10, one of the best James Bond scripts ever. Now, in terms of directors, there's one guy that's always been the perfect choice to reboot James Bond, and it's Martin Campbell. He did an amazing job with Pierce Brosnan for Goldeneye, and in fact, probably should have directed all the successive installments. He was brought on to direct Casino Royale in the hopes that he would do as good of a job in introducing Daniel Craig to filmgoers as he did with Pierce Brosnan. And boy oh boy did he ever pull it off. The opening parkour inspired chase sequence is probably one of the best action sequences in the series and immediately, immediately established Daniel Craig as this really unique version of James Bond. I mean, look at the stunt work. This is Daniel Craig doing a lot of his own stuff. It's not just insert close-ups against CGI backgrounds. This is Daniel Craig really showing his mettle as an action star. I think that anybody who had any doubt that Daniel Craig was born to play James Bond immediately after seeing this sequence changed their tune. In fact, I remember seeing this opening weekend, sitting in a movie theater, having two guys behind me going, oh man, at the end of the action sequence, and then whispering to each other, man, this is gonna be a really good movie. And indeed it was. Casino Royale is a really good movie, probably one of the best James Bond movies ever. So let's break it down a bit. Daniel Craig took so much grief for not being particularly Bond-like when he was announced, but fans all changed their tune the second they saw him in action, and he's incredible in this film. It's really exciting watching him on screen as you're getting the sense that a star is being born. The first time you really feel this way, actually, since maybe Sean Connery and Dr. No, you really see him coming into his own, and it's amazing. In fact, Daniel Craig was nominated for a BAFTA for his performance, and a lot of people thought that the Academy Awards were actually going to nominate him for Best Actor. He was kind of a front runner for a while, and in fact, he should have been nominated. This is probably one of the best performances of 2006, but alas, I believe the old fashioned Academy is a bit prejudiced against an action film. He should have gotten nominated, and I don't know, maybe he should have won. Daniel Craig is amazing in this movie. I give him a 10 on 10. You noticed. Now the villains. This is kind of unique because Mads Mikkelsen, who of course everybody knows now, was kind of an unknown when he signed on to play Le Chiffre, but it's a really good performance. And he's probably my favorite all around James Bond villain since Sean Bean back in Goldeneye. He's a physical threat to Bond and he has that amazing scar and the scene where he tortures Bond with the carpet beater is amazing. But the interesting thing is that Le Chiffre is done away with while the movie still has about 40 minutes to go. This is maybe a little bit uneven, but that's how it is in the book and I think it does work in the film's favor. Still, I'd give the villain a strong 9 on 10. You changed your shirt, Mr. Bond. I hope our little game isn't causing you to perspire. Bond Girl, however, this is where Casino Royale outmatches almost any other film in the franchise, really. The absolutely gorgeous Eva Green stars as Vesper Lind. Gee, baby, ain't I good to you? Mm. 
The woman that broke Bond's surprisingly fragile heart. And you know, if there's one woman that could convincingly ever turn James Bond into a one-woman man, Ava Green would be the one to do it. I mean, she's terrific in this movie. Her acting is awesome. She looks so good in a black dress. Her chemistry with Daniel Craig is absolutely off the charts. She's vulnerable. She's strong. Eva Green is the real deal in this movie, and I would give her a 10 on 10. Probably the best James Bond girl ever? I don't know. Tell me in the talk back what you guys think of this, but it's got my vote. You've got your armor back on. Has that? I have no armor left. You stripped it from me. The Bond music, pretty good in this one. David Arnold is back to score Casino Royale and he performs a really solid score which is a lot different than his Die Another Day score. If that one was bogged down by the fact that they were trying too hard to adopt the style of other action scores at the time, I'll say this, David Arnold was able to go back and give us an old fashioned James Bond score, which is maybe a little less techno based than some of his earlier bass scores. It's really orchestral and it sounds really good. And it has a pretty good theme song by Chris Cornell, You Know My Name, which has a great opening sequence with his really cool animation, although I did find that they got rid of the James Bond girls that usually dance in the opening credits, which was perhaps a nod to PC culture. I give the score about an 8 on 10 and the theme song about the same. Now, this one is interesting because it doesn't have any gadgets, and in fact, Q isn't in the film. The biggest supporting part probably goes to Judy Dench as M, who gets out in the field a lot and is given a much bigger role here than M has ever gotten in another James Bond movie, because the chemistry between Judy Dench and Daniel Craig is really good. They have this kind of mother-son thing going that really works for the franchise. I thought M was a randomly assigned letter. I had no idea it stood for... Utter one more syllable and I'll have you killed. Now, one of the things that has to be said about Casino Royale is that the action scenes are absolutely amazing. So there's the cool assassinations at the beginning that are done in black and white, ending with James Bond shooting a gun that turns into the gun barrel logo and had me standing up and cheering when I saw it in theaters. That amazing parkour sequence, the really cool airport chase where he blows the guy up, I thought that was awesome. And it's also got that cool ending in Venice, although I thought that that wasn't quite as good as some of the other action scenes in the film. But emotionally, I think it really works. The movie actually slows down quite a bit in the second half as James Bond plays poker, but man, I'll tell you, the stylish direction by Martin Campbell, the writing, the acting, it really makes you invest in the poker game. And I don't think that gambling has ever been as exciting on screen, maybe since, I don't know, maybe Rounders or something like that, as it is in Casino Royale. I mean, this is a really exciting poker game. I love this movie. I mean, this movie is amazing. Do you think of how much? Now, something that needs to be said is that Casino Royale, when it came out, was actually kind of soft at the box office. It was beaten on opening weekend by Happy Feet. Can you believe it? Happy Feet beat James Bond at the box office. But here's what happened. People started to talk about this movie and how amazing it was, and people started going back to see it two, three, four times. I don't even know how many times I saw it in theaters, but it was a lot. And eventually the movie grossed about 167 million in North America, which doesn't sound like a ton of money, but you have to remember this was a sleeper. The movie opened pretty soft, so nobody really thought that it was gonna even crack 100 million. So when it got to 167 million, this was a big deal and definitely assured the fact that the franchise would go on. And worldwide, the movie was an absolute mega hit. It ended up topping out at about $597 million worldwide, which is really good for a James Bond movie. Immediately, they went into production on a sequel, which admittedly, has kind of a mixed reaction amongst fans and definitely myself and we're going to get to that in the next installment but for one brief shining period the James Bond franchise was better than ever with Casino Royale which I give a 10 on 10 to. Now a lot of people have criticized the Daniel Craig films as being perhaps a little too reliant on the Jason Bourne formula. That is something that would definitely come into play in the next film but Casino Royale to me is the perfect mixture of an old-fashioned James Bond movie with a new school spy thriller. It really is an amazing film and probably one of my favorite ones in the franchise. If you haven't seen it in a while, I tell you, you gotta go back and revisit it. In fact, this has been one of the best James Bond revisited for me personally because Casino Royale holds up like gangbusters. Again, a 0010 on 10? Alas, the franchise wouldn't be able to continue going quite so strong because Martin Campbell, as is usual for him, didn't want to come back and do another one, so they had to replace him with another director, and the results were mixed. But we'll talk about that next time. The name's Bond. James Bond. If you like this video and you like the James Bond Revisited series, 
make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications every time we post the new video. We're an independent company, and you know what? We appreciate all of your support. Following the amazing critical and financial smash success of Daniel Craig's first James Bond film, Casino Royale, the producers of the franchise decided to strike while the iron was hot by quickly greenlighting a follow-up. Now, in the days leading up to Casino Royale's release, they were actually teeing up the fact that the next Daniel Craig James Bond movie, which was to be called Quantum of Solace, from a short story in the Free Your Eyes Only collection, was actually going to be out 18 months later. This would have been probably the shortest turnaround for a James Bond movie since the early days of Sean Connery. But in the end, cooler heads prevailed because I think it's pretty hard to launch a $200 million movie in 18 months, and they ended up waiting a more reasonable two years. However, the production of Quantum of Solace was plagued from start to finish, not the least bit by the Writers Guild strike, which derailed most TV shows in that era and seriously hampered the film, with apparently Daniel Craig and director Mark Forster having to come in to rewrite some of the sections themselves during the screenwriter's strike as Neil Purvis, Robert Wade, and co-writer Paul Haggis couldn't write due to union rules. Now, Quantum of Solace is a James Bond movie that's often heavily criticized. Most people consider it a vastly inferior sequel to Casino Royale, and I'm inclined to agree. I remember going to see this movie at a critic screening, which in fact would have been the first critic screening I ever attended for a James Bond film, and being let down. I think my expectations were so high after Casino Royale, I expected another all-out masterpiece, but what I got was not at all what I was expecting. First of all, it was a movie that was only 105 minutes long, which seemed really strange for a James Bond movie. When is a James Bond movie not at least over two hours? Watching the movie, it felt really like a clone of The Bourne Identity, or rather one of the Paul Haggis sequels. It was so evocative of the Bourne franchise that it felt like straight up plagiarism. And I felt like at times I wasn't watching a James Bond movie, I was watching a Bourne film. It had non-stop action, too much action. There was no flavor to the film, which I think is where Quantum of Solace really goes wrong. Instead, it's just a hectic jumble of action scenes, some of which I must admit are quite impressive. And the movie holds up a little bit better than I think people thought when it originally came out, but probably is the second worst of the Daniel Craig series. Now, the premise of Quantum of Solace is kind of interesting. This was going to be the first time in the James Bond franchise where we would get a direct sequel to the predecessor. And in fact, Quantum of Solace picks up right where Casino Royale left off with Mr. White in James Bond's trunk of his Aston Martin DB5 evading pursuers. He's wearing the same suit he was wearing at the end of Casino Royale. It's picking up right where it left off and it starts off in the middle of this insane car chase, which I must admit is impressive, but also impossible to decipher. I think Part of the problem with this movie is that the second unit director, Dan Bradley, who was renowned for doing the James Bond films, really seemed to almost be the director of the film and his style of filming absolutely dominated the movie, much more so than Mark Forster's. In fact, it would take quite a while for the actual plot and James Bondish elements of the film to actually fall into place with it taking a long time for us to even be introduced to the villain and the main James Bond girl, who in fact is not really a Bond girl at all in my opinion. So, in this movie, James Bond is on the trail of Quantum, the shadowy group that betrayed Vesper Lynn and set James Bond up. He finds Mr. White, who quickly escapes, and leads him to Dominic Green. Now, Dominic Green is a leading member of Quantum, posing as a businessman working in reforestation, a charity funding for environmental science. What he wants in this film is to create a coup d'etat by selling water back to the Bolivian government at rapidly inflating prices after creating an artificial drought. Basically, it's the premise of Chinatown, but in a James Bond move. Along the way, James Bond meets up with the kinda sorta Bond girl in the film, Camila Montes, played by Olga Kurilenko. Now, this is a bit of a strange piece of casting because Ora Kurilenko is, of course, Ukrainian, and she's playing Bolivian in the film, kind of in brownface, which I think wouldn't go over too well nowadays, but people didn't really have a problem with, I guess, 12 years ago. And Olga Kurilenko, I have to say, is actually a really good actress, and I think does a good job in the film. Like Bond, she's damaged, wounded, by the fact that Dominic Green, her lover, betrayed her and her family and had most of them killed with her sporting a back scar that speaks to the tragedy in her life. And in fact, there's a really, really effective sequence at the end where Heather, with her family having died in a fire, she's kind of paralyzed in this inferno that she winds up in with James Bond. And James Bond, in kind of a really gallant 
move really comforts her and saves her life, and I think is one of the most heroic moments for Daniel Craig in any James Bond movie up to this point. Now the movie does pick up on a lot of threads from Casino Royale. Rennie Mathis at the end of Casino Royale is captured because everybody thinks that he's betrayed James Bond, and in fact he turns out to be innocent, and in this movie is pressed back into service opposite Bond and dies a pretty quick death, which I think makes Bond feel kind of sad. And in fact James Bond inflicts a lot of collateral damage in this movie, with the most notorious being Gemma Arderton as MI6 agent Strawberry Fields, who is quickly seduced by Bond in a very stylish scene, but ends up being killed in a moment that I think is supposed to be a complete reference to Goldfinger with her dipped head to toe in oil. It's not quite as visually striking as the golden girl in Goldfinger, but it is kind of a nice moment. And James Bond indeed seems grieved by the fact that she dies, but also extremely cold-blooded, as Daniel Craig is throughout most of these movies. You see, in this, James Bond is on a path of vengeance with little time for any kind of emotion at all. And in fact, the original screenplay of the film was supposed to be even darker, with him discovering a child left behind by Vesper Lynn that he was going to abandon in the end. But of course, Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson did force the writers to tone things down a little bit because James Bond ultimately is a heroic and just couldn't abandon the child at the end of the film. One of the most notorious creative decisions in this movie was to hire Mark Forster, a German director to direct, who was the first Bond director that was chosen from outside of the British Commonwealth. Forster was a very accomplished director at this time, having directed Halle Berry to an Oscar win in Monster's Ball, in addition to Finding Neverland, Stranger Than Fiction, and The Kite Runner, and indeed would go on to direct a movie that became a huge, huge kind of what-the-fuck episode for us, World War Z. But at the time, you know, he was an A-list director, and I think was considered a very classy choice for Quantum of Solace, but it didn't quite work out. Mark Forster, as solid a director as he is, doesn't really seem like an action guy, and in fact, he doesn't put much of a stamp on the action scenes, which, as I mentioned, are really chaotic, and in fact, kind of seem ripped off from the Bourne franchise. If ever a James Bond movie was guilty of copying other action films, this was definitely the case with Quantum of Solace, because if the Bourne movies didn't exist, I feel like Quantum of Solace would have no style at all. Everybody involved clearly watched those movies and wanted to do as much of a James Bond approximation of them as they could. Fair enough, the Bourne series itself is heavily inspired by the James Bond series, but the way that he was fighting in those movies really does seem to get cloned here, and it's a bit of a disappointment because I think that Casino Royale struck a really nice balance between the new style of action scenes and an older school James Bond vibe. My biggest problem with the movie when I went to go see it is that it simply didn't feel like a James Bond movie. There was no glamour. There was no sex. Guten Tag. Uh, my family and I are looking for sex. Vikeland. There was a lot of action, but there was probably too much action. I think James Bond movies are at their best when they have a couple of really big set pieces, but then have kind of a compelling plot, a larger than life villain, a Bond girl, and this movie doesn't really have any of them. Olga Kurylenko is lovely, but her character is definitely not a Bond girl. The fact that there's no traditional Bond girl in the movie does make sense, of course, because Vesper Lynn died in the previous installment and James Bond is still heartbroken and betrayed. So it wouldn't really make sense for him to have another de facto love interest, although Although then again he does jump into bed pretty quickly with Strawberry Fields so I don't know it seems like they kind of lost the plot here a little bit. I remember seeing this movie and being blown away by the action. Too blown away. In fact, by the time the fourth major action scene in the movie began, less than 30 minutes into the film, I started to become numb to it, and the action scenes, which are kind of cool, are very, very hard to follow in this movie and totally lose their impact. They're just a jumble of shots that don't really make any sense. If Forrester does have a strength, I'd say that his visuals are pretty interesting. The production design of Dominic Green's Quantum Headquarters and the cinematography by Roberto Schaefer, and there's some really good style in the climax of the film. But this is too little too late, I think. There's some really dynamic shots, but the movie itself is kind of boring. Plotline just isn't any good. And chief among the problems is the villain. I think that Mathieu Amaric is a great actor. Everybody says he looks a lot like Roman Polanski, and I'm inclined to agree, although his eyes are crazier. But he's just it's not very memorable as the villain, although he does get a blood-curdling death scene where James Bond leaves him alone in the desert without any water, just some oil so that he could die slowly. It's pretty grim. They found Green dead in the middle of the Bolivian desert of all places. They found motor oil in his stomach. But there's never a second in the movie where I think he's a credible threat to James Bond. And I remember his second in command, Elvis, being terrible. He had a bowl cut which is revealed to be a wig. So I don't get it. He's supposed to be kind of comic relief. I mean, you're supposed to be afraid of the henchmen. You're not supposed to laugh at them. The 
the Bond villain in this movie is probably the worst we've ever gotten, so I'd give him a 5 on 10. Bond girl, as I said, she's not really a Bond girl. I love Olga Kurilenko, I think she's beautiful, and I think the character is quite intriguing, so I'd give her probably a 7 on 10, but it's just the fact is, there's no relationship. I do wish that the movie had actually not been a straight sequel to Casino Royale, and I jumped ahead at least a couple of months, you know, in order to show Bond a little bit more back in his groove to make it more of a James Bond movie. Or, if they had decided to go the really gritty route, just don't bother having a Bond girl at all. In fact, this kind of worked for the next film in the series, Skyfall. So. It feels like they were going halfway between a Bond girl and halfway between not having a Bond girl, so she was a compromise, and I don't think it really worked out. This is another one of the serious James Bond movies that doesn't really have any gadgets. Q only gets introduced in the next installment, which of course we'll get to shortly, although there's some beautiful cars. And my favorite thing about the movie is James Bond's tailoring in this film is absolutely on point, with all of his clothes being done by Tom Ford. I remember when this movie came out, I got myself a Tom Ford catalog, and I wanted to buy this really cool cardigan that he wears in the film. Of course, I I realized that the cardigan was something like $2,000. I ended up not buying it, but I got a bit of a knockoff that I wore for a while. For about two minutes, I think I looked a little bit like Daniel Craig, but you know, lost all my hair, so didn't get to look like him very long. One of the things that's kind of interesting about Quantum of Solace, though, is that the supporting cast is really good. Jeffrey Wright is back as Felix Leiter, who I didn't really mention that much in the Casino Royale episode, but I always really liked him in the part, and I think he's very strong in this film, with him having kind of a larger role than usual, although apparently his role, which was actually even bigger, Bigger originally was cut down due to rewrites. Another guy that comes into the film is David Harbour, who before he became famous doing Stranger Things, shows up as Greg Beam, a CIA section chief for South America and one of Felix Leiter's contacts. He's kind of a cool actor to have in a James Bond movie, and I found that he really kind of grounded the movie in international intrigue, but he's not in it quite enough. The movie has a kind of interesting musical score by David Arnold, and in fact it would turn out to be his last James Bond score ever, although fingers crossed that he'll eventually return one day. What's kind of interesting about the film is that the use of the James Bond theme was kept to an absolute minimum here, just as it was in Casino Royale. It pops up here and there, but really not too much. It's a totally different approach to the score, and kind of impressionistic actually. It's too bad that Arnold wasn't allowed to continue, because I always thought he was one of the greatest assets of the series, but they kind of seemed to lose interest in his musical stylings after a while, and I think that's nowhere more evident than in the fact that the theme song would be done by Jack White of the White Stripes and Alicia Keys, Another Way to Die, which is the first James Bond music duet, but also probably ranks as one of the least memorable James Bond songs ever. Jack White is many things, and I think he's great, but James Bondish? I don't think so, and I think that their use of the song doesn't really fit the movie too much, although the opening credits are kind of cool and stylized, although not very James Bond-like, I have to say. Now apparently this movie was one of the most product placement enhanced films of all time with a reported 50 million pounds being earned with Ford, Heineken, Smirnoff, Omega, Virgin Atlantic and Sony Ericsson all getting huge shoutouts in the movie. Why is this necessary? Because this also ended up being the most expensive James Bond movie to date, costing a rumored 200 to 230 million dollars in 2008 dollars. Now No Time to Die is apparently very expensive too, but with inflation considered Quantum of Solace is indeed the most expensive James Bond film ever made. And it's too bad because critical reaction to this film was not great. It earned an approval rating of about 65% on Rotten Tomatoes. And in fact, it was the first James Bond movie that I ever reviewed for Joe Blow, and I gave it a 7 on 10. Now, I know that sounds pretty good to you guys, but to me, as a James Bond fan that had a really hard time being impartial about the series, it was devastating. I remember going to see it and being sorely disappointed. And it was the first time that I realized, you know what, I was growing up as a critic because I could be fair to the film and not just be blinded by my absolute love of James Bond. A lot of fans were critical of the film, none more so than Roger Moore, of course, the great, great Roger Moore who played James Bond himself in seven movies, who said that Daniel Craig was a damn good Bond, but the film as a whole, well, there was just a bit too much flash cutting and it was less like a commercial of the action. There didn't seem to be any geography and you were wondering what the hell was going on. And I have to say that Roger Moore was dead on accurate in his rundown of the film. That's the problem with the movie. You just really don't know what's going going on at all. And the film was actually a financial hit, probably as big of a hit in some ways as Casino Royale. It broke box office records in the UK and did really well in North America. I think it was the biggest James Bond opening of all time with $67.5 million. It ended up grossing $589 million worldwide, which was pretty good. Quantum of Solace had the biggest opening weekend of all time for a James Bond movie and actually outgrossed Casino Royale by $1 million, although internationally it was 
was slightly less successful, and considering how much bigger the budget was, I would say that the profit margins for this film were minimal at best. It was a very expensive movie to make and to promote, and I think that people were kind of disappointed with it overall, including Eon Productions, who would take their time to craft a really solid third movie for Daniel Craig's James Bond. And of course, with Skyfall, they would get probably the biggest James Bond movie of all time, with box office records broken that are still standing to this day. It really would become a cultural phenomenon, and this movie was kind of seen by many as a misstep in the franchise. Watching Quantum of Solace again, I don't think it's quite as bad as some James Bond fans seem to think. It's definitely no Casino Royale, and it's not even nearly as good as Skyfall, which would be the next James Bond movie, but I do think in some ways it's better than Spectre, which would become the fourth James Bond film to star Daniel Craig. And I think that there's some really good things about it. Like I said, the cinematography is quite striking and there's some really dynamic sequences, but the action is just a mess and it's way too short. There's not enough story here, and I really wish they'd put off production of this movie until the Screenwriters Guild strike was solved. It would have made for a much better James Bond movie, and I think we'd all be much happier with the finished result. But as it is, Quantum of Solace is not a disastrous James Bond movie. It's just not a very good one and a disappointing second installment for Daniel Craig, and I give it a 6 on 10. But of course, things would start to look up on the next installment of James Bond Revisited. Bond, I need you back. I never left. If you like this video and you like the James Bond Revisited series, make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications every time we post a new video. We're an independent company, and you know what? We appreciate all of your support. The year 2008 saw the release of Daniel Craig's second outing as James Bond, Quantum of Solace. While just as successful as its predecessor at the box office, the movie's profit margins were slimmer than usual, due in no small part to a massively inflated budget due to the Writers Guild strike, which wreaked havoc on the production. Rather than race into shooting another film, the choice was made to take their time crafting a worthy follow-up, one that would please both fans and critics, neither of whom were particularly pleased by Quantum of Solace, or so it seemed. To that end, Eon Productions actually went to an A-list director this time, Sam Mendes, famous for having directed American Beauty and other acclaimed films. While nothing in his filmography suggested he could do a huge action movie, many were excited by the fact that he would sign on to a movie like this. It helped that he also had history with Daniel Craig, who'd famously played Paul Newman's coward son in his gangster epic Road to Redition. Working with John Logan, who wrote Gladiator, in addition to the usual James Bond screenwriting team Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, the decision was made to both open up the James Bond universe by introducing Q, a very badass version of Miss Moneypunny, and other elements, but also scale things down to make it a deeply personal story in some ways, with the focus being razor sharp on the mother-son relationship between Bond and Judi Dench's M. In the film, her past would come back to haunt her upon the return of her former golden boy agent Silva, who's been horrible horribly disfigured and is now a cyber terrorist. To play the part, Mendes and crew went to the best, Javier Bardem, play one of the greatest villains of his era in the Coen Brothers classic No Country for Old Men. His Silva would be layered, with him obsessed with revenge against the mother figure that had forsaken him to China, mirroring the fact that the film starts with Bond himself having been quasi-betrayed and left for dead. I may hit Bond. Take the bloody shot! And in fact, Bond is so upset that he's totally burnt out and living as a beach bum, only to return when MI6 is attacked. Once back, he meets Ben Wyshaw's Q, as well as Rafe Fiennes' Gareth Mallory, who wants M to step down. The screenplay for Skyfall ranks as one of the better ones in the series' history, with some razor-sharp dialogue and an intriguing premise, even if Silva's master plan is ultimately forgettable. In the end, he wants revenge on M, and Bond has to protect her. It's a rather intimate story, but a pretty good one. So, where the film shines is really how all the elements come together. The cinematography, the cast, the score, the theme song, everything about Skyfall is just kind of perfect and blends together so well. And in fact, it would lead to the film becoming the most financially successful film in the franchise's history. So let's start with the cast. I think that Daniel Craig gives one of his best performances ever as James Bond in Skyfall. Well, I'd still say that probably his debut at Casino Royale is the most impactful, and he was robbed of an Oscar nomination for that role. I think that Skyfall is just as good in a lot of ways, and I think that he benefits from the fact that a director like Sam 
Shawn Mendes is there to kind of mold his performance. Daniel Craig does most of his own stunt work, so his role as Bond tends to be extremely physical, and often he hurts himself so badly that he's totally burnt out by the time it's over. Craig is famous after pretty much every Bond film by saying he'd never do another one, and he doesn't ever want to do another James Bond movie, and it's just too much. But you know, that's part of the game. And I think that part of that is just the fact that Daniel Craig throws everything he's got into the role. And I think that's what makes him one of the best James Bonds ever. And Skyfall is arguably his most polished James Bond vehicle. And I give his performance as Bond in this one a 9 on 10. I think he's great. Where the hell have you been? Enjoying death. 007 reporting for duty. In terms of villains, you've got Javier Bardem as Raul Silva, who's been disfigured and was left for dead to be tortured by the Chinese by M and MI6. He wants revenge and who can blame him? And Javier Bardem is probably the best actor they could have possibly chosen for the part. You believe him as a former MI6 agent, but you also believe him as a guy that's gone completely insane. He's got that great blonde hair in the film and this kind of flirty manner with James Bond. In fact, I love their opening scene together. You feel like Silva doesn't really have an in for James Bond. It's just, you know, a victim of circumstance. And in fact, I think he sees a little of himself in Bond in this film. Bardem is really terrific and one of my favorite James Bond villains ever. And in fact, in terms of chronology, I'd say he's probably the best villain the franchise had since John Bean as 006 in Goldeneye, because there's a long stretch of James Bond films where the villains aren't all that much to write home about. I give his villainous performance a 9 on 10. <laughs> The Bond girls in this movie are a little bit different. There's Berenice Marlowe as Severin, who's Raoul Silva's associate and mistress, but she's really kind of a secondary Bond girl in this film. Of course, her and James Bond do have kind of a sexy shower sex scene, but she's done away with pretty quickly, and I think that James Bond's reaction to her death is extremely cold-blooded, and in fact rubbed me the wrong way a little bit when I saw the film. What do you say to that? It's a waste of good scotch. The main Bond girl arguably is Naomi Harris as Eve, a field agent, but of course she turns out to actually be a really badass version of Ms. Moneypunny, as she's this field agent who decides to take a step back and become M's assistant at the end of the film. Well, my name's Eve. Eve Moneypenny. I look forward to our time together, Miss Moneypenny. In some ways, what's really crazy about this is that the main Bond girl is actually Judy Dench's M, as she's the one that he ends up with at the end and is trying to protect. Sure, there's no romance between the two of them, but the mother-son surrogate relationship is stronger than ever in this film. So if you count Judy Dench as a Bond girl, well, she's one of the best ever, right? So you have to give him a 10 on 10. I mean, Judy Dench is great. It's not very comfortable, is it? Are you going to complain the whole way? Oh, go on then, eject me. See if I care. The rest of the supporting cast in this movie is wonderful. Q finally makes a comeback in this movie, even though there's not much in the way of gadgets. Ben Wishaw, who of course would become famous in his own right for voicing Paddington, is a great Q, and I really love him in these movies. He's young and edgy, and he regards Bond as kind of this dinosaur, even though they're not that far apart in age. I really like him in the part, and feels like the first person since Desmond Llewellyn to try and actually make the role his own. As much as I like John Cleese as an actor, with R, he was always just kind of imitating Desmond Llewellyn or doing shtick. Wishaw is actually playing a real role. A gun and a radio. Not exactly Christmas, is it? Were you expecting an exploding pen? Rafe Fiennes also makes his debut in the series as Gareth Mallory, who would later on become the new M. And I think one of the things that I got the biggest kick out of in this movie was when James Bond walks into M's office at the end, it looks like something out of a John Glenn James Bond movie from the 1980s, right down to the padded door. I got a big kick out of this, and I think that Fiennes is great because he does make the character sympathetic, even if it's not quite the surrogate parental relationship that Daniel Craig would have with Judi Dench. I think it's more of an M like relationship and makes it more of a classic James Bond franchise formula pick in some ways. I really like him in the part. Good luck, 007. Don't cock it up. One of the characters in the film that I get the biggest kick out of, however, is Albert Finney, who plays King Cade, the gameskeeper of the Skyfall estate which belongs to James Bond's family. Now, a grumpy Scottish gameskeeper, you have to think that this role was written for Sean Connery, right? I mean, how great would it have been for Sean Connery to come in as this grumpy old mentor for James Bond? And what a great swan song it would have been, but alas, it was not meant to be. And if you had to cast somebody else, well, 
Personally, I would have gone for Roger Moore, even though he probably can't do a Scottish accent. But Albert Finney, you know, Albert Finney, if you look at him when he was young, could have easily played James Bond. And I imagine he had to be on Eon's list at some point. Of course, it would turn out to be one of Albert Finney's last ever roles. And I really always loved him as an actor. So it's a nice swan song for him, too, as Kincaid. And I love the fact that he calls M Emma in the film. M, this is Kincaid, gamekeeper here since I was a boy. Pleased to meet you, Emma. One of the things, though, that a lot of people complained about in the film was that David Arnold was replaced by Sam Mendes' favorite composer, Thomas Newman. And in fact, I was a little bit upset by this originally, too. But I don't actually mind them kind of fooling around with the musical formula somewhat. In fact, I'm quite excited about the fact that Hans Zimmer is going to be scoring No Time to Die. Newman actually does a pretty good James Bond score, and I like the romantic themes in the film, probably more than the action themes. He does a good job, but man, the theme song by Adele, Skyfall, I mean, this thing was a juggernaut when it came out. Not only did it win an Academy Award, but you could not turn the radio on without hearing it. It really, I think, helped the film's box office go straight into stratosphere. And, you know, good on Adele. And I think it helped make her a megastar as well, even though, you know, it was already pretty famous before the movie got released into theaters. It's kind of a great song, isn't it? In addition to the theme song, I think the other thing that was probably the most acclaimed about this movie was the amazing cinema cinematography by Roger Deakins. No James Bond movie before or since has ever looked as good. Roger Deakins is probably the greatest cinematographer in the world and wow did he a great job. It blows my mind that he was only nominated for cinematography and didn't win but it also goes to show that the Academy has always had a bit of a prejudice against action films haven't they? Some of Roger Deakins' shots in this movie are absolutely gorgeous, especially the fight between Bond and Patrice in Shanghai. I mean, what an amazing moment. <laughs> And it's worth noting that this is the first James Bond movie that was ever partially shot for IMAX screens. Now, it didn't get the full IMAX format, which is too bad, and I'm still really waiting for a James Bond movie to actually do that. But if you went to see it on an IMAX screen, the aspect ratio, which was 235 to 1 in most prints of the film, actually expanded to about 178 to 1. It's pretty cool. Mendes' direction, of course, also can't be faulted here. Although I always kind of thought that he adopted somewhat of a Christopher Nolan vibe in the film, especially the big attack on MI6 feels like something out of the Dark Knight, right? I liked some of his ideas in the movie though, especially using the Animals 1964 cover of John Lee Hooker's Boom Boom in the big assault at the end. Now, some people have criticized the film for being kind of an home alone type home invasion thriller, but I mean, I love that, you know, James Bond, home invasion thriller, I'm on board. And I think it was so popular that it helped influence Rambo Last Blood to kind of make that also kind of a home invasion thriller in the climax. Didn't work quite as well there as it does here. Now, the movie was a box office juggernaut, it has to be said. In fact, it earned $1.1 billion dollars worldwide and at the time it came out it was the highest grossing film worldwide for sony pictures who was distributing the franchise at the time and the second highest grossing film of 2012. it was really rare at that point for james bond movies to make that much money they always kind of plateaued at about 176 to 180 million dollars domestically in north america the movie earned over 304 million dollars and the highest grossing James Bond movie of all time. Now, of course, some of you are asking that if adjusted for inflation, would Skyfall still be as popular? In fact, this would actually outgross the other most popular James Bond movie of all time, Thunderball, because if you adjust that movie for inflation, it made $1.047 billion, whereas Skyfall made $1.1 billion. So it's a thin margin, but Skyfall wins. And in fact, critics and fans raved about the movie nonstop. The movie got an A cinema score, which was pretty amazing for a James Bond film, and 92% approval on Rotten Tomatoes, which was really high. People really loved this movie, and a lot of people at the time were calling it the best James Bond movie ever. Now, I don't agree that it's the best James Bond movie ever, but I think it's a really, really good one. I still probably prefer Casino Royale by a slim margin, but Skyfall is just about as good a James Bond movie as we're likely to get anytime soon, so I give it a 9 on 10. 
In fact, Skyfall is so good it couldn't be helped that the follow-up would be seen as a bit of a disappointment by people because the highs that we reached in this movie were so epic that, well, even if you did a movie after this that was very successful, it would be seen as not successful just because Skyfall was such a juggernaut. The only way that Spectre, which would follow the movie, would be seen as successful is if it blew past the expectations that we had thanks to Skyfall, which of course it couldn't do. It's weird because the Daniel Craig Bond movies, in a lot of ways, are the opposite of the Star Trek movies. Remember when everybody used to say that the even-numbered Star Trek movies were really great? Well, in this universe, it's odd because it's always the odd-numbered Daniel Craig movies that are really good. And of course, Spectre wouldn't be quite as good as Skyfall. But is it as bad as you remember? We'll talk about it in the next installment of James Bond Revisited. like this video and you like the James Bond Revisited series, make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications every time we post a new video. We're an independent company and you know what? We appreciate all of your support. Hey everybody, welcome back to James Bond Revisited, and this week we're going to take a look back at the follow-up to the most financially successful James Bond film of all time, Skyfall, which of course turned out to be Spectre. Now, when Skyfall opened in November of 2012, it was a much, much bigger hit than anyone involved with the series ever could have realistically hoped for. It made $1.1 billion, which for comparison's sake, is twice what its predecessor Quantum of Solace made. There were a lot of reasons why Skyfall was so big, but one without a doubt was the fact that a four-year interval between films no doubt made James Bond's return to the big screen a monumental event, so right there interest was higher than usual for a Bond movie. Add to that the theme song by Adele, which was everywhere at the time, and the fact that director Sam Mendes really did go out and deliver one hell of a good James Bond movie, and you have a recipe for a series-changing blockbuster. But when it came to making Spectre, it seemed like everyone had one goal in mind, make another Skyfall. And now, this is probably where things went wrong as the movie eventually ended up opening to a rather cool reception by fans. It was still a financial success, not as big as Skyfall, but notably bigger than either Casino Royale or Quantum of Solace. Sam Mendes returned and was actually the first director since John Glenn back in the 80s to make more than one James Bond film back to back. Of course, Martin Campbell had made two James Bond movies, but he had several outings that he sat out between them. And I think maybe that's the key to be a really good James James Bond director. I think sometimes you do really need to take a breather because these movies take a lot out of a director. I mean, just think about it. Think of what must go into making a James Bond movie. Can't help but think it would be super exhausting, right? Especially for a director like Sam Mendes, who probably wasn't used to the logistical challenge of making a big action movie like this. When you watch Skyfall, you really get the sense that the director, in this case Mendes, is putting literally everything he has up there on the screen. It doesn't feel like this is setting up a big franchise. It feels like he was trying to make the definitive James Bond movie. Whether or not he was successful or not is really up to the average viewer. I don't know if I would say it was a definitive James Bond movie, but it certainly was a very successful James Bond movie. But I think by the time it was over, he was kind of done, right? But of course, it was so financially successful, there was never any doubt that they were going to bring Sam Mendes back, and he was enticed to come back and do Spectre, which I think in hindsight might have been a mistake. Apparently, a few other directors were approached with Nicholas Winding Refn actually apparently having been approached at some point or so he says. A Nick Reffin James Bond movie probably would have been really weird, to be honest. However, we didn't get Reffin. We got Mendes, and Mendes really did try to make Spectre amazing. And there are some technical aspects of the movie that are absolutely brilliant. For instance, there's the teaser of the movie, which takes place in Mexico City on Day of the Dead. And I feel like Mendes probably came back to do the movie just to do this sequence because there's this long, unbroken take that goes on forever and ever. And if you've seen his follow-up movie, 1917, it feels like this was a dry run for what he hoped to accomplish with that film. And you know what? If Spectre being kind of a mediocre James Bond movie got us the all-out masterpiece that is 1917, I'm kind of happy he came back and made Spectre 
Spectre, right? I mean, it's a great, great movie, 1917. And Spectre, well, not great, has definitely some moments. And this opening scene, which ends with this massive helicopter battle, is pretty insane, right? And I also love James Bond's Day of the Dead costume. It's pretty cool. And I think it shows off the cinematography by Hotier Van Hotayama pretty well. Now, of course, everybody was very disappointed that Roger Deakins didn't come back, but he had already done his James Bond movie. I think what happened was Deakins basically went by the lesson that I think Mendes didn't learn, was that he had put all the ideas that he had into a James Bond movie into Skyfall and didn't really have anything left over for Spectre, so he stepped out. And Van Hotema does actually, I think, a pretty good job, but a lot of people did criticize the photography when the film came out because it does look distinctly different than Skyfall. But no matter. Now, one of the things that's notable about this movie is that it had a really tortured production. And in fact, you can read all about it because unfortunately, Skyfall coincided with the Sony leak. Yeah, that's right. Back when the Sony servers were hacked before the interview came out, tons of information came out about Spectre, about the fact that the budget was completely insane, about some haggling between Sony and Eon and MGM, and basically the fact that the budget for this movie ended up being somewhere between 240 to 300 million dollars, which is just absolutely astounding. By comparison, Skyfall's rumored budget is only between 150 to 200 million dollars. They really, really put a lot of money into this film but I think it was kind of all for naught because creatively they just didn't have the same stuff that they did in Skyfall. Now that's not to say they didn't try. Neil Purvis and Robert Wade of course were back to write the script but they had an assist by John Logan and Jez Butterworth. Now the intention with this movie was to bring all the previous installments in the Daniel Craig canon together and relate them all to that classic criminal organization that they hadn't been able to use since Diamonds Are Forever, officially at least, Spectre, Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge, and Extortion. Now, I've gone into it in other episodes why they couldn't actually use Spectre, and it was due to some legal rights haggling with Kevin McClory, but by the time Spectre came out, all that had been resolved, and it was time to bring back Ernst Stavro Blofeld. Of course, they didn't tell anybody this when the movie was being made. No, no, they were all pretending that Christoph Waltz, who was cast in the role, was going to be playing a guy named Franz Oberhauser. They wanted it to be a big surprise, which is kind of like when they cast Benedict Cumberbatch's Khan in Star Trek Into Darkness. I think that when people actually realized that he was playing Blofeld, they were kind of disappointed, right? Because they didn't build up the character at all. They made you think that he was this other guy, and then, oh, he's Blofeld after all, who's this iconic character. It doesn't really make any sense. And he's got hair. I mean, I'm sure they're going to make him lose the hair at some point, whatever, but uh, I don't know. He didn't seem like Blofeld to me, that's for sure. Anyway, they really tried to draw together the events of the other films by saying that Mr. White and Silva and all the villains, Le Chiffre, and all the bad guys that he's faced up to now were all working under the umbrella of an organization which turns out to have been Spectre. It was all me, James. It's always been me the author of all your pain. But I never really understood why they felt the need to really always kind of make it seem like Daniel Craig was fighting one enemy in all of these movies. Skyfall kind of did away with that, and I think that it really worked in that regards because it allowed them to tell a pretty simple and emotional story, which in the end was all anchored by the affection that 007 had for M. Here, M is more or less gone, but they still can't resist bringing Judi Dench back for a cameo by having her show up in a video recording, which I felt kind of cheesy to be honest because we have a perfectly good M now, who is of course playing played by Ray Fiennes. The premise, of course, is that MI6 is under bureaucratic attack by a new character named C, who I think that Ray Fiennes actually is one of the best lines in the movie where he says, you, you, I know exactly what C stands for. And I thought he was gonna say, you know which word, but then he said something else. And now we know what C stands for, careless. Uh, but yeah, he plays C, who wants to shut down MI6 and wants to install this new intelligence initiative called Nine Eyes. Of course, Bond isn't really involved in this. He's off chasing that mysterious terrorist organization that he was clued into in the teaser that, of course, is Spectre. Along the way, he gets to sleep with Monica Bellucci's Lucia Sciara, the wife of the guy that he kills at the beginning of the movie, Hucky him, and goes on to Austria, where he gets to meet Mr. White once again, and meets up with Dr. Madeline Swan, who we're supposed to believe is supposed to be James Bond's true love. But the problem is, as much as I like Lee Sidhu, who 
plays the part, her chemistry with Daniel Craig isn't that great because they really don't give her a lot of time to build a relationship with Mon. They're barely together for any time at all before we're supposed to believe that they're kind of in love. It's not like his relationship with Eva Green's Vesper Lind was in the other film where it kind of slowly grew over the course of the film and he had room to breathe. There's too much action and too much going on in this movie if you ever to believe that they could even have a personal connection beyond just a purely physical one. Anyway, so let's break the movie down. Daniel Craig, I think, still does a great job as James Bond in this movie. I think physically this must have been an even more punishing movie than Skyfall because he's doing some pretty insane stunts and it was after this movie that he kind of told the people that he'd rather slit his wrist than come back and do another James Bond movie. Of course, he wasn't serious because he did come back with no time to die, but I think this was a really tough shoot for him. His physical performance in this is great, and he's a really good James Bond at this point. Maybe not quite as sharp as he was in Skyfall, just because he doesn't have the material, but I digress. He's very good, so I give him an 8. As far as the Bond ladies go, I'm thrilled that Monica Bellucci finally got to be a James Bond girl, but she's barely in it. She has one brief love scene with Daniel Craig where you don't really see much, and it's fine. I'm glad that she's in there, and I'm glad that you get to say that Monica Bellucci at some point in her life was a James Bond girl. But the main Bond girl in this is Lee Sidhu as Madeline Swan, who's actually the daughter of Mr. White. I never really bought that she was his daughter. I didn't really get that connection and why they brought that into the movie. It felt kind of convoluted. Again, I think Leah Seydoux is an amazing actress. I just didn't really buy the character, but I'm very curious to see what they do with her in No Time to Die, because I know that she's back and I know Christoph Waltz is back, and I'm curious to see if that movie kind of redeems Spectre somewhat. Naomi Harris also is back in a much smaller role this time as Ms. Moneypenny. So the Bond girls in this one are a mixed bag for me. I'd say probably a 6 on 10 just because Madeline Swan, who's the main Bond girl, doesn't really feel like the next love of James Bond's life like we're supposed to believe she is. Villains here are a real disappointment though. I was expecting Christoph Waltz to be an amazing Blofeld. Even though they were calling him Franz Oberhauser, I still knew that he was Blofeld because I had read some of the Sony leak and I thought that Waltz was going to really pull it off, but I think they went the path of least resistance. I think they chose an actor that was too obvious a choice for the role. I mean, Christoph Waltz by this point has played so many villains, right? It's it's kind of boring when you cast him in a villainous role. I think Christoph Waltz is actually kind of better in heroic roles like he was in Alita Battle Angel. Playing a bad guy just seems old hat for him, and I think he's kind of boring as Blofeld, although of course they are bringing him back in the next movie. I don't know to what extent, but uh, I was very disappointed by his performance. I think the only one with real menace in this movie is Dave Bautista as Mr. Hinks, who Spectre's top assassin and only has one line of dialogue, although it's a great line of dialogue. Physically, he's a real match for Daniel Craig, and is actually bigger than him, and I think that uh, in some ways Dave Bautista might have made a better Blofeld. Just make him a really tough, totally reimagined Blofeld. Bautista's got a lot of depth, you know, still waters run deep. I think he would have been great, but you know, they just make him the muscle bound henchman and that's disappointing. I give the villains in this one a very disappointing 5 on 10. The gadgets, there's not too much here. Ben Wishaw is back as Q, and you get to see James Bond's Aston Martin DB10. Otherwise though, not a huge role for Q, except that he gets to clue Bond in on some, some information involving Spectre, but not a great role for him at all, I didn't think. So gadgets in this movie get like about a two or a three on 10, although it's a great car, I have to say. It is a really great car. The score by Thomas Newman is actually not as sharp as it was in Skyfall. I really liked what he did for the saga in that film. I thought he brought some interesting themes into the James Bond universe, but Inspector, I felt he was kind of doing the same thing that he had done in Skyfall. And I really didn't care for the pop theme song by Sam Smith, which was, again, everywhere when this came out in 2015. They were trying to make this the next Skyfall breakout smash, and in fact, did win an Academy Award, although I thought it didn't deserve to win the Academy Award, and it was a song that kind of annoyed me. So I give the music in this a very disappointing five out of 10. As for the movie itself, a lot of people have said that this is one of the worst James Bond movies ever, but I really don't agree at all. I think people are really mistaken when they say that. I think the problem with Spectre is that it's just not Skyfall. There are things about it that are great, and I think that if it had come out in between Quantum of Solace and Skyfall, I think people probably would have loved Spectre because it's so much better than Quantum of Solace is. There's a lot of really good action. There's that amazing teaser. Um, there's some really good photography, and there's some really good action sequences, but it just doesn't really kind of come together as a film. I remember when this came 
out, I gave it about a 7 on 10, which I think was probably just too generous because I love James Bond movies so much. In hindsight, I have to give it a 6 on 10. I don't think it's terrible, but then again, I don't think a lot of James Bond movies are terrible. I don't think Quantum of Solace is terrible. I think Quantum of Solace is pretty good, but I think Spectre and Quantum of Solace are kind of on the same level in that way. Neither movie is terrible, but they're just not as good as they should be. That said, financially, it was a pretty big hit. A lot of people seem to think that it was kind of a flop just because it didn't gross as much money as Skyfall did, but it still made $880 million worldwide. And that is probably the second highest grossing James Bond movie of all time after Skyfall. And it was notably bigger than either Casino Royale or Quantum of Solace. So while it wasn't the size of a hit that Skyfall was, Spectre was still a very successful movie. Now, I think that Spectre is one of those movies that might be better in hindsight once we finally get to see No Time to Die because apparently it does pick up on a lot of the threads left by Spectre. So I'm waiting to see. I'd love to do another James Bond revisited of Spectre, maybe take two a couple years from now where I go back and I say, oh, you know what? Spectre was actually amazing because it was just dropping us all these hints for what was to come in No Time to Die. So, we're pretty much all caught up with the franchise now. All that remains is No Time to Die, which opens on October 8th. But we're not quite done with James Bond Revisited. Oh no, we've counted down all the James Bond movies and we revisited all the James Bond movies, but now the time has come to rank our favorite James Bond movies, our favorite James Bond villains, our favorite James Bond girls, gadgets, and more. So join us next time for our first ever official James Bond Revisited ranking, the 10 best James Bond villains of all time. Coming soon to Joe Blow Videos. If you like this video and you like the James Bond Revisited series, make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications every time we post the new video. We're an independent company, and you know what? We appreciate all of your support. Hey everybody and welcome back to what is probably one of our last episodes of James Bond Revisited or at least until they release a new James Bond movie or even sign a new James Bond while we unpack No Time to Die. Now of course when I did my regular review of this movie I really couldn't dig too deeply into spoilers because you know didn't want to ruin the surprise for everybody but suffice to say this is a monumental film for the franchise so I think it was about time that we did an episode of James Bond Revisited that that unpacked the movie a little bit. So, No Time to Die is the 25th movie in the James Bond series, and of course, it was delayed quite a while due to COVID-19. It was originally supposed to come out in April of 2020, but we only got it on October 8, 2021. Coincidentally or not, my birthday. So, this movie will forever be known as the James Bond movie that finally killed 007. Now, one thing that I should preface this with is that James Bond's death in this movie shouldn't be taken as the ultimate death of the character. I think that this is definitely the death of Daniel Craig's version of James Bond, but it's no different than, say, if Batman was to die in a movie. You'd still see another actor playing Bruce Wayne picking up the cowl as Batman a couple years further down the line. I mean, granted, we've never had Batman get killed, but, you know, I fully expect them within a few years to sign another actor to play James Bond and to have him be basically the same character. I don't think the intention of anybody involved with this movie ever was to kill James Bond permanently. I think Think really what they were trying to do is just continue on the experiment that they were doing with this character where James Bond in the Daniel Craig versions of the films was never really the suave and sophisticated secret agent that we knew from you know the other 20 or so installments of the series this James Bond had a lot more pathos you know he was a guy that wasn't as quick to womanize um, he had a lot of heart he was betrayed of course in Casino Royale by Vesper Lynn so they were really trying to do something different with this iteration of Bond and I I think that having him die at the end of No Time to Die is actually a great way of making him come full circle. Now, 
Apparently, Daniel Craig indeed was reluctant to return to the role after Spectre because he had messed himself up physically doing the part. And of course, the movie opened to pretty bad reviews and mixed box office for a James Bond movie, considering the triumph that Skyfall was. Nevertheless, they were able to entice Daniel Craig to come back with, you know, this one promise, that he would be the first actor to ever play a James Bond death scene. Now, even Daniel Craig in interviews since the movie's come out has said that the intention is never been to actually kill off the character permanently. And sure enough, if you watch No Time to Die right until the end credits, you'll see at the end of the film, very clearly written, James Bond will return. Now, when he will return is the big question, and what James Bond will be like when he returns. So many actors have been associated with the part already. Some people say it's going to be Regé Jean Page. Other people say it'll be Tom Holland, which I think is pretty unlikely. Other people say it might be Tom Hardy. I think in the end it's going to be a James Bond that was totally unexpected. Probably an actor that we've all heard of at this point, but would never actually associate with James Bond. That's kind of how Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson do things. They never want to give you too obvious a choice. I think the only Bond that you could potentially have predicted maybe was Pierce Brosnan because he had been associated with the role before. But I really think that when they do another James Bond movie, it's going to be somebody completely unexpected, like maybe a Jamie Bell or something like that. I'm pretty confident that the next Bond will be a male and will be British or at least European. But other than that, who really knows? So, back to the film. Originally, Danny Boyle was supposed to direct the film and co-write the screenplay with John Hodge, but they left in August 2018 due to the commonly cited creative differences, and a lot of people thought that they were let go because they wanted to kill James Bond. Now, we know now, of course, that this was always the intention, so whatever they wanted to do with the character, I'm sure it was probably pretty radical, but maybe too radical for Eon. They ended up hiring Kerry Joji Fukunaga, who of course was famous for having done season one of True Detective, and apparently they actually approached it with the idea that they would kill off James Bond, but Fukunaga, you know, to his credit, told them that they had to earn that ending and that that would be his responsibility, of course, to decide how they were going to earn this ending that everybody wanted. And, you know, to work on the screenplay, he had Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, who, of course, have been writing James Bond movies for years, and I think are often underrated because, you know, a lot of people sometimes mock the James Bond screenplays as being assembly line or not good enough, but I think that Purvis and Wade always do a really good job. It's sometimes the other writers that they bring in that don't really mesh well. And, of course, you know, James Bond movies, as much as I love them, is definitely movie-making by committee, so I don't think Purvis and Wade's vision of the character has ever really been fully realized. So for this film, Fukunaga himself has a screenplay credit, and then they brought on Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Now, of course, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is famous for having done Fleabag, and of course, everybody assumed by bringing Waller-Bridge on, they'd be making No Time to Die quote-unquote woke. The people that said this, however, probably have never actually watched Fleabag before because it's probably the least woke show on TV. I mean, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is one that likes to push the envelope in a lot of ways, so I was pretty comfortable when I heard that she was signing on to do the film because I think probably what they wanted was to just give the character, you know, a sense of humor. And of course, when I actually interviewed Daniel Craig just before this movie came out, one of the things I mentioned to him was the fact that I thought this was one of the funnier James Bond movies, to which he replied, Do you think the others were funny? I thought they were fu funny, but this one was hilarious, though, at times, no, and, I, and I really liked that. I'm joking, as I'm joking. That was a gag. <laughs> a bad one, clearly. I'm glad I'm not writing them. So in terms of screenplay, I think that No Time to Die probably has the best screenplay that we've gotten since... I don't know, maybe Casino Royale, or maybe Skyfall, it depends. And as much as Paul Haggis, you know, is kind of loathed and despised these days, I think he did a really amazing job when he did uh, when he did Casino Royale, and I think he really helped relaunch the character in a smart way. And I think that John Logan and Sam Mendes kind of did something similar with Skyfall a couple of years ago. So this is definitely one of the stronger screenplays that we've had in a bit, and I would actually give the screenplay of this movie a solid 9 out of 10. So, what's the story? Well, interestingly enough, No Time to Die picks up hot on the heels of Spectre, which is a surprise because the movie was so poorly received and is maybe one of the least seen James Bond movies ever. I think a lot of people skipped Spectre when it hit theaters because the reviews weren't great. Of course, to really appreciate No Time to Die, you have to have seen Spectre because it picks up on all the threads. They bring back Leah Seydoux's Madeline, who's with Bond now, and Bond apparently has retired, and they're trying to live happily, and he's trying to bury the ghost of, you know, Eva Green's. Vesper Lind. One of the things that I didn't really like about Spectre was that I felt that the relationship between Madeline Swan and Bond was never as deep 
as they tried to convey. I never really felt that they were in love at the end of the series, but I think that really No Time to Die rectifies the situation a lot by giving Leia Seydoux a lot to do as Madeline Swan. And I think from, you know, I originally considered her one of the B-list Bond girls after watching Spectre. Now she would probably be in my top five. I mean, I think she's really an outstanding Bond girl and Seydoux is a great actress, so it's nice that they gave her some really good material to chew on. So in this movie, Blofeld, once again, played by Christoph Waltz, who I never really liked in Spectre and I still don't really like in No Time to Die, is orchestrating this revenge plot against James Bond, and James Bond thinks that Swan was involved. Of course she wasn't, but, you know, they separate, and five years later, Bond is kind of living off the grid and is approached by Jeffrey Wright's Felix Leiter to help him rescue a scientist, played by David Densick, who's invented this kind of nanobot technology that makes this amazing bioweapon that is coded to an individual's DNA, making it lethal to the target and the relatives, but harmless to others. Now remember this, of course, because this becomes very important in the climax. So Bond goes on the rampage and meets up with the new 007, played by Lashana Lynch. Now, of course, this was also very controversial because all the headlines screamed, oh, there's a new female black James Bond. Of course, she's not playing James Bond, she's playing 007 because it's a designation that, you know, MI6 gives out to agents. So, of course, there would be a new 007, and I think that Lynch, for all the crap that she was taking in the lead-up to the movie, is actually really good, and she has kind of a nice give and take with, with Daniel Craig, especially towards the end of the movie where they become kind of partners and clearly respect each other. I always really thought her performance was good. Permission for Commander Bond to be redesignated as 007. It's just a number. Very well. Agreed. So getting back to the plot, so Bond, of course, is betrayed, and Felix Leiter is actually killed in the first big twist that this movie has coming, and it's got a lot of twists coming up. Bond also teams up earlier on in the film with a CIA agent named Paloma, who's played by the great Anna de Armas, who I think blew everybody away in this movie. Nobody ever really saw her as an action heroine, but I think she really nailed it. I mean, she doesn't look physically tough, but she's gorgeous, has amazing attitude, and I think that probably her role here is what landed her the lead in Ballerina, which is the upcoming spin-off to John Wick. So really good job for her in this movie, even though she only really has that one extended sequence and isn't super important to the plot. She really does kind of steal the show and she's got great chemistry with Craig, of course, who was her co-star in Knives Out and apparently pushed for her to get the role. You were excellent. You too. Next time, stay longer. I will. Eventually, Bond returns to London to try and get to the bottom of the plot and realizes that this villain named Safin, played by Rami Malek, is the one who's in charge of everything and, of course, has a deep connection with his former lover, Madeline Swan, who we learn has a baby that might belong to James Bond. Who knows? It's five years old. What a surprise. She's not yours. But, um, the, okay, the blue, blue eyes, just... Anyway, it all ends on an island, of course, like most of the James Bond movies do, with a big extended shootout that involves James Bond killing lots of bad guys and eventually dying in the end of the movie in a big bit at self-sacrifice because his DNA is coded to the evil bioweapon, so if he gets out, his daughter and his lover are both in big trouble, so what can you do? Bond heroically dies. Although, I would say, despite what Daniel Craig has said, this has always seemed to be a soft death to me. You know, I think whenever you see a character like James Bond die, unless you see him get decapitated and then swing the head around in front of you, I really don't think the character is actually dead. You know, that said, I don't think he's going to. I think that it would be a cheesy move, but I still think they hedge their bets just a little bit. So, as I said, the screenplay for this movie, probably about a 9 on 10, but the big disappointment for me is in terms of the villains. I think Rami Malek's a super nice guy. I had a great time interviewing him, and I think he has a really cool look as Safin, but they don't give him enough to do. I mean, he's just kind of your generic evil madman who's kind of out of the movie for the first half. Unfortunately, his thunder is kind of stolen by Blofeld, once again played by Christoph Waltz, and they spend way too much time on this character. I mean, Blofeld is probably the greatest villain in James Bond history, but the rebooted Blofeld played by Christoph Waltz to me has always been really lame, and the fact that they try to make him and Bond kind of brothers never really worked for me. I think what they should have done was just kind of ignore the character or totally reboot Blofeld. You know, pretend that the guy that was playing Blofeld wasn't actually Blofeld and then make Rami Malek Blofeld. Hopefully they 
do go back to the character and Spectre in the next series of James Bond movies, but they really need to start over again because the Blofeld here just never really worked for me. So the villains for me are a letdown. I'd only give them about a 5 out of 10. For me, it's the weakest point of the movie. However, Bond Girls, one of the strongest points. As I said earlier, Madeline Swan was not one of my favorite Bond girls in Spectre, but I think she's terrific here. I mean, Sadu is an amazing actress. She's been good in so many movies, and they really give her a lot of material here. I think that Fukunaga and Waller Bridge, everybody involved knew exactly how to write for her, gave her a lot to chew on, and she's terrific. You really feel that her and Daniel Craig's James Bond in this movie are in love, which I think, you know, brings the franchise full circle. One of the things that's really interesting about this movie is that Fukunaga was heavily inspired by On Her Majesty's Secret Service. The score by Hans Zimmer has a lot of nods to that movie, and it really does feel kind of like the most emotional and epic Bond movie since then. I mean, On Her Majesty's Secret Service was always considered the longest Bond movie at 2 hours and 20 minutes, and No Time to Die actually beats it, running at 2 hours and 43 minutes. It's a little too long in my estimation, but they do earn the running time because the love story is quite strong. In addition to Leah Seydoux as Madeline Swan, you also get Lashana Lynch as Nomi, who would probably kick my ass for calling her a Bond girl, but hey, she's great. And of course, you get Paloma, played by Anna de Armas. And man, she is great. And call me crazy, but she's pretty good looking, isn't she? And then, of course, you get Naomi Harris back as Money Punny, who, of course, turns out to be another great ally of Bonds in this film. And I always loved her and thought she was great in the series. And if anything, I'd kind of like them to bring her back as Money Punny and maybe Rafe Fiennes back as M and Ben Wishaw back as Q. But I guess it's probably not going to happen if they're rebooting the character somewhat. Anyway, Bond girls in this movie, very strong. I'd give a 10 out of 10. Love all the Bond girls in this film. So what does No Time to Die not really have? Gadgets, I would say. I mean, I think that Ben Wishaw as Q gets a pretty good role in the film. They do reveal that he's gay, which I think was a nice nod. Of course, Bond is completely cool with it and doesn't even raise an eyebrow, which I think makes sense because, you know, it is the 21st century after all. He doesn't really outfit him with much equipment to this movie, but becomes very important in the last act when he's trying to help Bond kind of decode this evil bioweapon. And of course, he's crushed when he realizes that Bond's going to sacrifice himself. I was sad too, Q. So gadgets were pretty lame in this film, but otherwise, I mean, I think No Time to Die really holds up as a pretty good Bond movie. It's loaded with action, has got a great car chase in the opening teaser, which is one of the longest in the franchise's history. Now, if I have a problem with the movie, is that I think it becomes a little too generic of a shoot 'em up towards the end of the film when he infiltrates Safin's island. Now, according to the internet tallies here, Bond actually only kills 14 people, which is a bit on the low side for a James Bond movie, but it didn't really feel that way. I mean, the end of the movie, he's just running around machine gunning baddies and I almost thought it was like a video game. One of the things that was kind of disappointing to me was that he doesn't get a really good physical adversary in this movie. You know, Inspector at least he had Dave Bautista and they had that amazing fight scene. I think the problem is though that Daniel Craig really hurt himself doing that and I don't know if they were able to do that physically for him here. So that's a bit of a disappointment but it's got lots of cool stunts and I think Fukunaga really did choose an amazing cinematographer to shoot this movie. I really like what Linus Sangren did and I think it's one of the best looking Bond movies since Scott Skyfall. One of the other things I have to mention, of course, is the score by Hans Zimmer. I think Hans Zimmer, his entire career, has always wanted to do a James Bond score, and you can really tell in the scores for Inception, and especially Sherlock Holmes' Game of Shadows, that he really likes John Barry, especially his score for On Your Majesty's Secret Service. So this must have been like a dream assignment for him. And of course, he reuses a lot of really cool John Barry themes in this movie, and they end it with Louis Armstrong's We Have All the Time in the World. So the score for this movie gets a strong 9 out of 10 for me. A little too self-referential at times, but I really liked it. So how does No Time to Die stock up against the other James Bond movies? Hard to say. When it came out originally, I gave it about an 8 on 10, but I have to say, I'm always a little bit overwhelmed by James Bond movies when I see them just because I'm such a huge fan of the franchise and I'm trying to think, oh, how does it stock up with the others? In terms of Daniel Craig's run as James Bond, I would put it square in the middle. I still think that Casino Royale is probably one of the greatest James Bond movies ever made and definitely Daniel Craig's strongest James Bond film, but right behind it is Skyfall, which of course is terrific and has a really good Daniel Craig performance. I think Daniel Craig is amazing in this movie. I think that it would probably be pushed up just a little bit above Skyfall 
overall if it had better villains, but it doesn't, so it's right in the middle. I gave it about an 8 on 10 then, and I would probably stick to that now, maybe an 8.5 out of 10, because I liked it a little bit more rewatching it than I did when I saw it the first time. Pleasantly surprised, an excellent James Bond movie with a terrific performance as James Bond by Daniel Craig. It's his last one, but it's a great one. In terms of its reception, I think critically it was extremely well received. One of the best reviewed James Bond movies ever. Got an 83% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is pretty strong for a James Bond film. And I'm glad that people really sent off Daniel Craig with a lot of critical praise. The business run of it was a little bit different though. I mean, it was always bound to be a bit of a disappointment just because, you know, it's we're in a pandemic and it was never going to be able to have the same numbers as other James Bond movies did. I think the fact that it ultimately grossed about $160.8 million in the United States in Canada is actually a pretty strong total, even though the worldwide gross of the movie came in at about $774 million, which is way below the $800 million worldwide that they needed in order to break even. I think the film eventually will make money because of streaming and home video and all that, but I think inevitably it wasn't going to do as well as the other films in the franchise. And had it not come out during COVID, I really think it probably would have been a much bigger hit. Maybe not quite as big as Skyfall, but definitely bigger than Spectre. So I don't think it would be fair to call this a box office disappointment at all. It's still one of the highest grossing movies of the year, and I think that people still have an appetite for James Bond. But what I think really makes James Bond great is the fact that there's a bit of scarcity involved. They're not just pumping out James Bond movies every year and there's no James Bond extended universe which I really think would kind of kill the franchise. I got a little bit nervous when Amazon and MGM started talking about a deal because I could see Amazon wanting to do a James Bond series. Luckily we've got Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson who are never going to let that happen and as long as they remain the stewards of the franchise I think we're in pretty safe hands. So No Time to Die, definitely the last James Bond movie for a while but I would imagine within the next four or five years we'll get a new James Bond and a new James Bond era too you know, obsess over like we did the Daniel Craig era. I'm very excited to see where this franchise goes, but as far as I'm concerned, No Time to Die left things on a pretty nice note. So that's the end of James Bond Revisited for now, anyway. I'd like to thank my editor, Nick Bosworth, who always did a great job putting together this series with me. And, you know, I hope we're back before long. It's been a pleasure doing this series, and I hope that you've all enjoyed listening to it. I'm going to tell you a story about a man. His name was Bond. James Bond.